Welcome to everyone who's out there watching us and a huge bravo to Sullivan Fortner. Oh my God, how amazing to do a concert like that and how we all wish that you could hear us applauding. Oh wow, that's really nice. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, it, it must have been strange to play all of that in an empty room, huh? Oh, extremely strange. Um, I kind of been used to it. Uh, we've been doing quite a few of these stream concerts, either at being at home or at a recording studio or Steinway Hall. So I kind of got used to it at a certain point. But sometimes, you know, after you play, you're kind of like, all right, cool. All right, I worked out, I sweated it out and I'm looking and I don't hear any claps. I'm like, dang, I must've sounded bad. And then I look out and I'm like, okay, nobody's here. Okay, <laughs> so that's cool. Yeah. And you yeah. don't even have, I mean, it's not quite like when you're doing a recording, that's a different scene too. But yeah, I yeah. mean, it was such a beautifully done concert. I mean, just amazing. I am so blown away by your pianism and musicianship and your left hand and sense of counterpoint is just like, really amazing to me oh, i mean oh thank you so much thank you I really you know and it. i told you i you know i've been loving the the recording that you did with um cecile mclaurin salvin but it's so much fun to actually see what you're doing you know it's yeah. a whole different thing when you can see it because it's sometimes really hard to figure out which hand is is doing what there um oh. So let's go, let's like go back to the beginning. I know you're from New Orleans, which is of course a great music city and yeah. started playing piano as a kid, but like, when did it become jazz? How did, how did the whole thing evolve for you? Um, well, one day I was sitting, I remember sitting in church one day, it was a choir rehearsal. It was a youth choir rehearsal. We were preparing, we were preparing for a musical and friend of mine who was in the choir bought a, bought a friend of his, a guy named Ronald Barker. Ronald sits down at the organ and just starts playing just stuff I'd never heard before. He was playing Bach, he was playing jazz, then he did some salsa music, and then he just kind of went through all the different styles. And I sat and I watched him and I was just like blown away because at 11, 12 years old, I had never seen anybody come to the organ and play like that. And he told me, he said, I said, where did you learn to do all of that? Like, how did you, how did you learn all of these different styles? And he said, man, you need to go to, to, to the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. And so maybe it was that summer I applied. I applied on a hymn because I couldn't play a scale. I didn't know any, I didn't even know how to play a blues. But you're you're time. how old at this point? I'm 12 years old. And um, I apply and I get in. And that was my introduction to, to I mean, being in a music school. I remember the first, my, my first day of classes, I, I, I stumbled on a level three, level four ensemble and there was no piano player there. And um, uh, Christian Scott was playing. Oh, and, amazing. Trombone Shorty Andrews, and they asked me to come in and play a blues. And I was like, well, what's a blues? I mean, the closest I had heard the blues was like a TV on, on television on some like movie or whatever. So I just played a really slow blues and that was it. And I've been playing jazz ever since. So you didn't grow up, I mean, up until 12, it's not like there was a lot of music in your house. I mean, there was a lot of music, but it was mostly gospel music and mm -hmm. R and old school, 60s, 70s, 80s R and B. Mm -hmm. So my dad was like really earth. He say, "Boy, you want to learn how to play the piano? You need to learn how to play some Earth, Wind, and Fire, some Stevie Wonder stuff." So I was like, "Okay," so I had to learn that. <laughs> well, starting mom, with Stevie Wonder, could you know you could do worse than that, right? <laughs> yeah, you could do much worse than that. You know, do much worse than that. Um, but gospel music was really where my heart was and where um, and my mom just drilled in, drilled that music in me and my sisters every day, you know, driving up to New Orleans, you know, to go to school. Interesting. Well, um, I have a very specific question for you, which is how have your studies with Dr. Harris informed your playing? 
And I don't even know who Dr. Harris is, but this is um, a question from the audience. I'm thinking they're talking about Barry Harris. So yes. Barry Harris, for those of you who don't know, is one of the one of the living geniuses, grandmasters of 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 bebop piano. Um, I mean, just a little bit of background. You know, he came to New York in the fifties with Cannonball Adderley, and I mean, since then it's recorded. He was on the Sidewinder record with Lee Morgan. He um, um, he lived with Thelonious Monk. He studied with Bud Powell. You know what I mean? It's just. I mean, Dizzy Gillespie and Coleman Hawkins, he's collaborated with the greats, you know, in this music. I started going to his class when I started playing in Roy Hargrove's band. After a friend of mine heard me, he was like, you need to go and you need to sit and listen and sit under Barry Harris's feet uh -huh. and learn everything that you can. And that was about nine years ago and I still go to that class. Um, really? Yes, absolutely. He is, um, he basically taught me the importance of, of understanding movement and understanding movement of harmony. Uh, there, there are quite a few counterpoint that you talk about counterpoint. There's some things that I got directly from Dr. Harris and a few other influences. Um, certain movements in harmony really becoming more and more fluent with the bebop language and learning tunes. Um, yeah. Barry Harris is the man. <laughs> and then um, you studied at Oberlin, right? Yes, Later on. Um, is I mean, how did you develop your technique just as a pianist, other than hours sitting there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, basically it was hours sitting there. Um, I had a I had a really good classical teacher in high school, uh, but after like two or three years of studying with her, I had began to develop some really, really poor habits. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, my, my wrist was doing all kinds of funny things. And I was, I was, I was kind of playing in a way that was going to cause me problems much later. Mm -hmm. So my piano teacher named Sanford Margolis, he kind of broke a lot of things in me, you know, as far as, you know, just kind of just technical things. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a bunch of Chopin etudes, he gave me Brahms etudes, he gave me Bach. Yeah, I he hear those Chopin me. etudes. I was gonna ask you specifically about that. They seem to oh, be yeah. in you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's, yeah he's, he gave me quite a few of those. Uh, I remember him giving me the uh, Paganini variations. And, and I had a lot of friends who were great pianists and I used to hang out and go to their house. And, you know, they would cook and we would just sit and just have a good time. And I would play for them and they would give me some pointers and how to approach some of the music and how to approach piano playing and sitting, um, pedaling and things like that. Interesting. So it was a really good atmosphere at Oberlin and a real mix of classical and jazz musicians got to hang out together because that no. doesn't happen enough. Well, they didn't really necessarily hang out a lot together, per se. I mean, uh -huh. there were a few stragglers in the, in the classical department that would kind of come and hang out with the jazz musicians and then vice versa. We'd go to their concerts and hang out. Um, but Oberlin was definitely one of those places. They had a very, very strong jazz department. Um, a lot of like world famous Grammy award winning teachers that were kind of like, you know, we could go and not only study with them, but we would go hey, eat out with them, go eat, go have dinner with them, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they would come, you know, to basketball games and they would hang out, football games. They would come to our house and eat, you know what I mean? It was a very, very they were very, very hands-on. And because they were so approachable and hands-on, we learned a lot of things that, you know, didn't necessarily have to do with the art of music making, but they always told stories and they always had, you know, antics and funny things that they <laughs> that they used to have with them. yeah for sure yeah that that's fantastic so in terms of you know you're playing tonight which was so phenomenal and um the way what you do with the standards like i have to say what you where is love which you kind of turned into a kind of impressionistic prelude kind of 
really beautiful, pensive, and you know, that song can get kind of sappy, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I mean, mm -hmm. same thing with Somewhere from mm -hmm. West Side Story. Those things can get sappy, but you found just the right place for it. And then the complexity of like the harmony and the counterpoint and stuff. I mean, even like what just what you did to the Cole Porter, just one of those things, you know? So what influences do you feel have been really strong on you besides the people that you've actually studied with? Oh, um, I mean, I had, a, I had, a, I had so many teachers. Um, um, Dan Wall. What about just like who you listened to or really people oh. that? Well, Eric Garner was my first introduction you know, that was the first awakening moment because, you know, going to being at NOCA, initially I didn't really like jazz at all. You know, I didn't like say, who's this Herbie Hancock guy? I really didn't like him. Uh, you, you know, I hated, you know, um, Oscar Peterson, even though he could play really fast, all the greats, it took me a while to kind of get into. That is so But Errol Garner was like an, uh -huh. yeah, but Errol was immediate. There was something about Errol Garner's playing that was like, instant and um yeah so i mean and that kind of just like that was like my bridge and then that helped me cross over to all the other great ones you know um but there yeah, so arrows number one art tatum for sure i can't stress enough the importance of art tatum and, and and you know and what he means to to pianists yeah, I don't know if you heard my intro, but I, I definitely mentioned Art Tatum because no. I mean, I hear that and I can't think of a higher a higher compliment, but just that's, I really that's that's too high for me, but I appreciate <laughs> No, the spirit is there and you know the fingers too, because I mean his technique is just, you know, awe inspiring. It's, 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 really it's awe -inspiring. astonishing, yeah. What about, um, I mean, other than the Chopin, are there other classical music, you know, composers you've listened to? We've got oh, one listener out there who's hearing Hindemith in some of your stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know? Hindemith, Hindemith no, Messian, um, Rimsky Korskov, um, um, Ravel, of course, Debussy, um, um uh schumann who is my absolute one of like in my top two favorite classical composers um so do you play any classical repertoire either for yourself or for myself for myself uh -huh. for myself very very slowly i mean my girlfriend sometimes has to <laughs> endure me clonking away at some of these pieces <laughs> well i mean i don't think speed would be an issue for you that's for sure um you know it's come up one of the questions that came up during the concert and i think it, you know i'm a classical pianist so it always comes up for me which is i mean you're a brilliant improviser when you do a recital like this how much freedom in terms of your own arrangements i mean how much is preset and how much is spur of the moment and um i would say once I pick a tune, I mean, for that particular concert, I picked a few songs that kind of were reflective of, you know, certain people, certain mentors and people in my life that had passed away. So I did um, Where is Love in dedication to Jet Clayton, who had just passed and he had just did his memorial service maybe right before hmm. um, I recorded that. Um, so I did that as kind of a memorial to him. Um, just one of those things that always takes me back to the time I played it with Diane Reeves for the uh, American Pianist Association competition. Um, yeah, there's just, there's just certain pieces that I, if I play, I kind of instantly go back to that time period. And there's some things that are very reminiscent in, in the arrangement of what I did when I was playing with those people. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part, I would say a good 85 to 90% of it was completely improvised. Like I had no clue um, how I was going to play the tune. I just kind of played it. I just played the program straight through. It was like, okay, what did it, what tempo did it need? Did it need to kind of incline? Did it need to be faster? Or did it need to be slow? Do we need a really fast one or do we need a ballad? Like what do we, you know, I just kind of feel it as I go. 
That is just amazing to me. So like, but when you do the Cole Porter, just one of those things, say you do it again in three weeks or something, mm -hmm. will it be similar? Uh, probably not. It would probably, be, it would be very, very different. Probably a different key, probably a completely different mood. Um, for me, I'm very, very sensitive to, to key signatures. Mm -hmm. And if I play it in a certain, if I decide to play it in a certain key, the mood would be completely different. Mm -hmm. And the way that I play it would be completely different. Um, if I decided like, okay, I'm really hearing the lyric being really slow. Uh, I'm hearing a singer really kind of really milk these lyrics. I want to really milk it. I probably play it slow. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I just kind of. Well, what about with your own compositions? Like something like K Diablo? Well, K, <laughs> that's kind of, um, uh, that's one of those pieces that it's kind of hard for me at this point to kind of detach myself from the way I normally play it. I think that particular time I played it was the first time I had played it like that. And it was because it had been a while since I played it. And mm -hmm. I kind of did that on purpose <laughs> so that maybe hopefully it would put me in a different mindset as far as like certain things that I'm used to playing on that tune to kind of get away from that. Just to break up the so monotony, the tune, so to speak. I mean, what stays the same besides the tune? Because the tune is like, the tune is gets buried in there, right? I mean, yeah. does the rhythm of the opening stay the same? Because that's like very striking in a way. Um, the, 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 I guess the melody and the, and the rhythm of the tune and, 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 you know, yeah, the rhythm and maybe if anything stays consistent, it's maybe what I'm hearing the drums do in my head. Mm -hmm. for lack of a better way of putting it um whenever I play I kind of tend to hear an entire orchestra play <laughs> so I'm always constantly mimicking other instruments that's very you cool. know yeah so well, whether the it be piano like, is yeah. great for that right the piano oh, yeah. is the instrument of illusion it just imitates other it is an orchestra in and of itself yes ma'am absolutely Okay, we've got some questions coming in here. And I should say to anyone who's listening, if you want to post a question, please be sure to open your Q&A in order to do that. Um, favorite Sun Ra album? Oh, Jesus, that's really difficult. There's an album that I've, that I've been kind of having in my head for a minute. Um, it's an album of him playing standards. Very strangely enough, it's a quintet album. I don't even know the name of it, <laughs> but uh, just the just his comping on there, and the way he approaches those tunes and the way he plays, uh, the way he improvises on there was just like startling, because it's very sparse, it's very minimal, but what he plays, it, it seems so abstract, but it's also so inside at the same time. Uh -huh. It's really, really baffling. It's almost like he took the language of Duke Ellington and, and Thelonious Monk and all those people and just flipped it upside down and totally just stripped it. it it's really baffling to listen to. <laughs> I love it. I love That's, it. It's really interesting because, I mean, also in your playing, you have such an incredible sense of the inner rhythm of the silences. Like, the silences have so much stuff going on in them. I mean, there's so much yeah. rhythm in them. So, you know, you've worked a lot with vocalists. I was talking about the Cecile McLaurin Salvin recording. You've mentioned Diane Reeves. You've worked with Dee Dee Bridgewater. What about, like, what goes on when you work with the singers? Ce you know, Cecile certainly has such a specific point of view as a composer herself. How how do you interact when you, you do that together? Do you just like each do your own thing and agree on stuff or she, <laughs> you know how she wants to do the song or you can't even put it into words? Um, Cecile, working with Cecile was a very, very special situation because she pretty much allowed me to play whatever I wanted to play. Um, I remember one time I got a, we did, we played um, SF Jazz out here in, in, in San Francisco. And I got a real negative, I got a real, I got a negative email afterwards saying that how I was distracting from 
her artistry and, you know, very, you know, like, oh, you, you know, we came to see her and not you and you were just all over the place. And I guess early on, me and Cecile had the, um, and I wrote this, you know, early on, we made a decision that this wasn't going to be a situation where I was just going to play behind her. Right. Like we were going to be in conversation. And a lot of the great singers that I worked with, you know, Diane Reeves, Dee Bridgewater, Roberta Gambarini, you know, Stephanie Jordan, on and on, Joan Belgrave, all of these people were really about not just being supportive, but about being conversational. Mm -hmm. Like you give me something, I and, and and then I will give you something. You know, just like that that interplay that we have whenever a horn player plays with a with a with another instrumentalist, you know. Yeah, well, you so, feel your sense of space in, in, in the CD, certainly. I mean, it's very much a duo. It, you know, it, and, and yeah. I, you know, Cecile's made other CDs that are absolutely great, but this one is different because it's you and her, you know, it's, yeah. it's got a different musical vibe to the whole thing. Yeah. Um, we have a request for a Roy Hargrove story. Oh. <laughs> Uh, well, I give you. I'll give you the first. The first gig I played with Roy uh, was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We played at uh, this club called the Dakota, and um, I showed up maybe an hour, two or three hours after I was supposed to have come in because my flight was delayed for some reason. It was bad weather coming out of New Orleans, going up to Minneapolis. It was like, okay, well, I show up and go straight to the club for sound check. And I'm looking, I'm like, well, where's the sheet music? All right, I'm ready, I'm here to play, where's the sheet music? And I look at the saxophone player and the saxophone player looks at me and says, there's no sheet music. <laughs> now he, now next to him is a binder of like all of this, it's like a blue folder of all of this sheet music. But he was like, well, what's in that binder? He said, it's sheet music, but it's not legible. You won't understand it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, so what do I do? So Dwayne, I remember Dwayne Bernal was playing bass. And he was like, I will take care of you, young man. <laughs> so we play, we play a song. Roy shows me, he gets on the piano and he plays down the tune for me one time. He looks at me, he's like, you got it? I was like, one more time, just give it to me one more time. I'll have it. So we play one more time. And, you know, because of my bringing in church, I'm just used to kind of learning things pretty quickly. So anyway, we get through the sound check and uh, the gigs at seven show up just in time. Roy calls the first tune and it's nothing that we rehearse. That entire set was nothing we rehearsed. So I was like really on P, P's and Q's, just like, oh, well, what am I gonna do? So, okay, just rely on your ear to carry you through. Uh -huh. Long story short, after the, after the set was over, <laughs> I'm like backstage with my head down, just <laughs> like, and I look out the corner of my eye and I see two men walking towards it, or what I think is two men, it's two figures. And they get closer. And I look at them out the corner of my eye and I'm like, is that Michael Jackson? <laughs> it's like, no, it's not Michael Jackson. It was, it was Prince. <laughs> so Prince came to the first set and he sat right behind me the entire, I didn't know it. He was sitting right behind me the entire set. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Roy says, Roy and Prince are talking and they're, they're hugging and all this stuff. And by now everybody's coming with the camera. Prince is like, please, no pictures. He was so nice, you know. And then uh, he said, who's the piano player? I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, it was me. He said, yeah, I gotta, we got to talk to you about your wardrobe. The shirt that you're wearing is just unacceptable. Because <laughs> I, had like a, I had a red, white, and black striped shirt on and he just uh -huh. he hated he completely hated the shirt but he, he said I did well and Roy was very happy and I've been I was in that band for about seven years after that that is amazing and you just did the ideal lead into our last question from a listener which is where do you get your suits oh 
<laughs> well, this is um, Issey Miyake. Um, so one of the great perks of playing with Cecile is that she, uh, she whenever there's an off day, she likes to kind of go shopping for clothes that, that really don't have buttons. She doesn't <laughs> like, Cecile doesn't like buttons at all. Uh -huh. you know, she's just like this whole since she has this whole thing it's like, I really don't like buttons please when if you if you come play with me we got to do something about these buttons so she took me to the Issey Miyake store and she was like you should try some of these clothes and I'm like but they don't have clothes like that for men and she pointed to a whole wall of all of these suits and all of these shirts and all this stuff so I went and bought a few and I've been wearing them ever since they're very comfortable they're very easy to wear on the road and yeah. And they look great. Okay. Yeah. So come a long way from that first Roy Hargrove gig, right? Now? Yeah. You got yeah. Yeah. your suits too. Yeah, I got a few suits out of the deal too, you know, so life is good. I still got a long way to go, but I'm grateful for, you know, all the opportunities that I've had so far. And I'm really grateful to be able to play for you guys at the cameras. Really well, awesome experience. Well, we can't wait to have you here live. I mean, we'll be working on it, but I know we've got like a whole, everybody is waiting to hear you here live and we can't wait to welcome you in person. So thank you thank so you. much. You have a gig tonight in California, right? You're about to play? Yeah, I'm getting ready to do a sound check right now at this club called Piedmont Piano. Okay, um, well have a yep. great show. And Thank you. Uh, we're all there with you and we'll look forward to seeing you in person. Safe travels, be well. And thank you so much, Sullivan. Really. Huge thank promo. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care. And thank you to everyone who's been with us tonight for your support, your enthusiasm. And we hope to see you again very, very soon. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.